This is Curious Minnesota, a Star Tribune project that sends staff from the state's largest newsroom hunting for the answers to great questions we receive from you, our readers. We're here to answer everything you want to know about the state's people, places, and culture. Welcome to Curious Minnesota. I'm your host, Eric Roper. Today we look into what happens to all the bottles, cans, and other things we toss in our curbside recycling bins. Recycling is one of my beats of the paper, and frankly, I get excited about covering recycling because it connects decisions we make on a day-to-day basis in our homes to complex international markets, markets that have been changing a lot in recent years. Today, we chat with Kate Davenport of Eureka Recycling about what they do with the stuff in our big blue bins. If you live in Minneapolis, St. Paul, or a handful of Twin Cities suburbs, your recyclables travel to Eureka's facility in northeast Minneapolis to be sorted. Before we dig into the details, let's hear from Doug Hoipel, who asked this week's question. My question is, what percent of recyclables that we put out to the curb are actually recycled? I had heard that the market for raw recycled materials fluctuate. What happens to recycled material if there's no buyer? Is it stored in a warehouse until the demand increases? So before we get to the big picture, I just want to talk about what happens when I put my things in the big big blue bin in my alley and it goes to the sortation center, in your case in Northeast Minneapolis, how do they sort these things out? What is the process that gets it to become a recycled item? Yeah, so we're essentially unscrambling an egg. So all that material gets put in the big cart, aluminum, paper, plastic, glass, comes to our facility and we use a mix of people and equipment to sort that material out back into its original packaging category. So cardboard boxes get sorted separately from newspaper, aluminum, from 10 different kinds of plastic and glass. And as I mentioned, we do use people to do some of that sorting and then equipment screens, magnets, optical sorters with lasers that are sorting plastic. And then we sell that material to markets that turn it into new products. So we sell, for example, cardboard to the West Rock Mill in St. Paul, and they're turning that back into cereal boxes, for example. And I've been to the facility. It's kind of a combination of the machines are using the geometry of the items that we toss to sort of just with physics, let some bubble up to the top like cardboard and glass falling down to the bottom and breaking. And then there's humans that are literally pulling things off that they see that are not supposed to be there. And then there are really high tech things like optical sorters that are just putting a laser beam on a piece of plastic to determine what kind of plastic it is, right? Correct. So we're using size, shape, weight to sort it. We sort paper from containers because paper tends to be two-dimensional. Containers tend to be Mm -hmm. three-dimensional. And so we use people and machinery to do that. We're processing about 45 tons per hour. So it's not like somebody's picking up one thing at a time and sorting it. Um, And so it's, it's a pretty sophisticated process. Right. And I can imagine that, you know, you receive all sorts of very strange things like small kiddie pools and pipes. We've talked about this before. And so those are things that you don't want and people should look them up. But what are things that are regular stuff that people might be tossing away in the recycling bin that you don't don't want as well. Not super strange things, but things that would seem very normal to us. We have actually gotten a live chicken before. That's not that's not a daily <laughs> occurrence, but that has happened. But we get lots of plastic bags. For example, we have to shut the facility down two hours a day to cut the plastic bags off the shafts of our equipment. So we get a lot of that. We get scrap metal. People look at a frying pan, they're like, metal recycling. That can't go in your curbside recycling cart. You can take it to a scrap metal facility. Counties have resources on that. And then we, we also get things like batteries that we really don't want because they're a huge fire hazard. And there was a facility here in the metro in Blaine that burned down because of lithium batteries. So those are the kinds of things we really don't want. We can really cause damage to our equipment and are a safety risk for our staff. And I would just say for people listening, go to your local county or city website in the metro area, particularly these days. Most of them have a breakdown of every little item that you could think of. And Eureka also has on their website a good lookup, or at least their app has a good lookup to look up various things and what to do with them. Yeah, Um, go to your app store, Eureka Recycling, and we have a great app. Got it. So this leads to the question is, you know, how much of what I'm recycling is not being recycled? The answer in Minnesota really comes more down to, you know, how, you know, how much are you receiving that is not meant to be recycled, right? So like, that's the residual rate, you call it mm-hmm. in your business. So what, what is that about? 
Yeah, so our residual rate's around eight and a half percent. So that's the amount of material that doesn't get sorted into bales and sold to market that is incinerated, as most waste in the Twin Cities is incinerated. And that's primarily material that comes in and is not recyclable. Actually, the industry average across the U.S. is typically around 15 to 20 percent. So in Minnesota and at Eureka in particular, we're pretty proud of the fact that we have such a low residual rate. And that is due to the fact that residents do a pretty good job of not putting things in their bin that aren't recyclable. Right. And this really gets to the core of recycling, which is that it really relies on the sortation center to be able to sell it to someone at the end of the day, right? That's sort of what makes this whole thing possible. Right. So we need markets in order to deem something recyclable. We can't accept something if somebody doesn't want to buy it and turn it into new, new material. And so that's really, that's very critical. So the, the question really, I think, stems from some of the national headlines that we've been seeing where a perfectly good Coke bottle or something, you know, by the tons, these things are being landfilled and incinerated. And this gets into a, an international situation that's occurred in recent years with recycling. Could you walk us through that a little bit? A lot of recyclable material prior to about 2017, 2018 in the U.S., about 35 to 40 percent was going to China. That's where the demand was for recyclable material because that's where the bulk of so much manufacturing was happening in the global economy that we live in. And also, particularly on the coast, it was cheaper to ship in empty ship, shipping containers back to China than it was into the middle of the country. So China was absorbing a lot of the material that we sorted in the United States. They, as their economy has grown and they started pushing back on the quality of the material they were getting. They were getting, for example, bales of cardboard that were really contaminated with other plastics and non-recyclable material. And so they pushed back on the U.S. and European recycling markets and basically shut the doors in 2017, 2018. And that flooded the U.S. market. Um, it couldn't absorb all of that material. And so there were stories about material being landfilled, particularly on the West Coast. That situation, um, we've had actually about 15 paper mills announced to be open in the United States in the next couple of years to help absorb that capacity. So it was a pretty big crisis there, but it has started to kind of work itself out. But we didn't see here in Minnesota the same types of effects where large quantities of recyclable materials were being incinerated and landfill, partly because of the regulatory structure that we have here. Right? Correct. Correct. So we have a regulatory structure that requires if material is coming into a facility, at least 85% of that material needs to go to market or you can't be deemed a recycling facility in the state of Minnesota. Um, we also have really strong markets here, both in Minnesota and regionally, um, and there are a lot of factors of, for that. But for example, 85% of Eureka's material that we receive and sort stays in the state of Minnesota. So for example, the West Rock facility in St. Paul gets most of the fiber that we sort and sell. We have a glass facility in St. Paul called Strategic Materials that buys all the glass from all the recycling facilities in the state. We have some plastics recyclers in greater Minnesota. So we've got folks that are taking all kinds of stuff. The, the ecosystem here has done a lot of investment into recycling markets. Okay. Basically, now we're in an environment where with the pandemic, that's been the latest sort of like international situation that's also affected recycling. How do you see that on your end? I mean, because recycling centers have been continuously operating throughout this whole situation, right? Yeah. So we've been deemed an essential service in the context of the pandemic. It's been very interesting. We saw an immediate decrease in material coming from restaurants and office buildings, which makes sense. Interestingly, because of the pandemic, we saw fiber pricing go up pretty dramatically, increase of 100% because there was such demand for cardboard boxes, for home delivery, for toilet paper. At the same time, we saw a decrease in pricing for aluminum, for example, and steel because those prices are highly impacted by what's happening with car manufacturing and home construction. And we saw a decrease in that. We saw a real decrease in plastics pricing. As some folks may remember the price of oil dropped below zero at the beginning of the pandemic. And so plastic pricing is highly tied to the price of oil and natural gas. So we've seen increases in some of our commodities because of the pandemic and decrease in others. It's an interesting place to remember that recycling really does link into supply chains that 
give us products that we consume every day. And so just generally, I mean, I think one of the conclusions that we have here is that, you know, if I recycle something that is recyclable here in Minnesota, it's getting recycled. We're, we're not in a state where we're seeing really any examples of any large extent of landfilling or incineration of recyclable materials, right? Correct. And the one thing that just complicates this that we talk about a lot is that as a consumer, we're getting more and more that we buy every day that's not a can that we know, like what we used to know. It's not the, the types of packaging is getting more and more complicated. How do you deal with that? Or how, are, how and how should we be dealing with it as consumers? Because not everything is as simple as it used to be. Yeah, we're seeing a lot more complicated packaging. We're seeing plastic packaging that's two dimensional. And that means that when it goes through a facility like ours, it gets sorted into the paper. We're seeing mixing of materials, all kinds of challenges. And so our approach to that is to really go back up to the design of that material and to the the brands and the producers that are making that packaging to say, you really need to think about the end of its life in that design. We can't just continually adjust to constantly changing packaging forms. It costs millions of dollars to run a facility like ours. Lots of capital investment. So there's a lot of talk right now, both at the state level and the federal level around how to standardize and, and make the national recycling system more effective to look at having actual producers and brands invest in and be responsible for their packaging design. Otherwise, a recycling facility is just running around trying to catch everything and figure out what to do with it. And it's not efficient or effective right. um, in terms of achieving our ultimate goal. And this may seem like a tangent, but it's actually related to the question because if you toss some of these things away, that ends up being part of your residual rate, right? Correct. And the pressure has really been on consumers for a long time to be educated. And we're really pushing back and saying, no, the brands that make this material need to be part of the solution. They need to design and invest in the system so this is convenient and easy for consumers to understand. We can't put all of the pressure on residents to figure out what does and doesn't go in the bin. It's super complicated because we're seeing such a variety of packaging types now. Well, Kate, thank you so much for coming on. I feel like we got a lot of great context about what's happening here in Minnesota around recycling. So appreciate all your help. Yeah, absolutely. A quick addendum here. I reached out to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for some additional details about Doug's question. If recyclers cannot find a buyer for the material they accept, they can temporarily store it indoors or ask the agency for permission to temporarily store it outdoors. More importantly, though, it is illegal to landfill or incinerate recyclables in Minnesota. The agency had never granted permission to do that until this May, when it allowed a metro area recycler to dispose of 60 tons of recycled material due to the rioting in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Thanks for listening to Curious Minnesota. Do you have a question for us? Record it using the Voice Memos app on your phone and email it to curious at startribune.com. If you have any feedback about the show, please send that to the same address, curious at startribune.com. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Curious Minnesota. We want to hear from you. Ask questions and read more stories online at startribune.com backslash curious. Our show is recorded at the Star Tribune's headquarters in beautiful downtown Minneapolis. And our music is produced by Matt Gilmer. If you like the show, please rate us on iTunes or leave a review. And until next time, stay curious. <laughs>